So my name is Susan Weiselitz. I am the Lieutenant Governor for the state of Connecticut, and it's my uh, great honor to welcome you here to our Vietnam Era Veteran Recognition Ceremony. Uh, and if you are able, we would ask you to rise for the singing of our national anthem to be followed by our Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to invite out Lisa Zolkevich Ives, who is going to perform our country's national anthem. There we go. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars invite up Mr. Doug Newell of the American Legion, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and give a few welcoming remarks. said that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and the friend of my enemy is my enemy. And as one former president once famously quipped, the most dangerous nine words are, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. In 1919, just after World War I, President Woodrow Wilson traveled to Europe to assist in making the peace. He came equipped with his 14 points, which included his plan for a League of Nations. And among those 14 points, his belief in people's right to self-determination. A young Vietnamese man studying in Paris sought a meeting with President Wilson to enlist his support for the Vietnamese people's right to self-determination. The, the, the meeting could not be arranged. 
After World War II, the same Vietnamese man sought an audience with a new American president to enlist his support under the new proposed United Nations Charter for the Vietnamese people's right to self-determination. That meeting, too, never took place. At World War II's end, the U.S. government both supported and assisted in France's return to assert control over its colonies in the French Indochina. In both instances, that Vietnamese man was Ho Chi Minh. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, and the friend of my enemy is my enemy. That slight cost us over 58,000 brothers and sisters. Thank you. And good luck. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us to honor and say welcome home to our Vietnam veterans. And I want to start out by thanking Mayor Cervoni and everyone at the Wallingford Town Hall who helped find all of you. Um, when I approached the mayor about um, having this a recognition ceremony today. He was extremely enthusiastic and set about the task to find all of you. And you know, you might think that somewhere there's a magic list in Hartford or in Washington, D.C. of everyone who has served in our United States military, but the best list exists at the town halls across the state because that's where you file your DD-214 discharge papers and that's where you uh, apply for your veterans tax exemption. And so um, I want to thank uh, the mayor and everyone at Town Hall who helped find all of you. Today uh, we have the opportunity to say thank you for your service and welcome home. I've had the great honor of visiting um, 95 towns across the state and met thousands of Vietnam veterans. And uh, we are holding this ceremony today because sadly, when you came home uh, 50 years ago, you did not get the thanks, the recognition, the celebration that you earned. And you know, you will remember that uh, those who came home from World War II came home to celebrations, to ticker tape parades, to uh, great fanfare. And sadly, after all you went through, uh, you did not uh, receive the welcome that you earned. Um, I will say that we learned a very difficult lesson as a country from you, and that lesson was no matter what you might think of a particular war or the leaders that have sent you there, we must always, always thank, acknowledge, and serve those who served. And so we thank you for teaching us that important lesson. And today we have the opportunity to acknowledge the challenges that you faced when you served, and those included um, pounding monsoon rains, a stifling jungle heat, some very intense urban combat, um, exposure to toxic chemicals like Agent Orange, and after serving, to come home to jeers, protesters, to be told perhaps not to wear your uniform when you came back on a bus or a train or a plane because of those protesters to be called the names that you were called was not something that you deserved. So we hope that today, in a small way, we redress that terrible injustice. Uh, because today, uh, we have the opportunity to 
honor you for your sacrifices that you made, you put your lives on the line for freedoms that we enjoy in this country, the freedom to worship as we choose, to speak as we choose, to elect our leaders. These are things that are extremely precious and that you sacrificed for. Um, and we, we are so grateful for that. I've had the opportunity to meet thousands of Vietnam veterans and to the person, our Vietnam veterans shared these two qualities. First of all, resilience. To go through everything that you had to go through, uh, whether it was in Vietnam or elsewhere around the world, in our own country, to receive uh, some of the unconscionable greetings that you uh, may have had to endure, uh, despite all those challenges and despite all those, of those difficulties, you show this incredible resilience to come back to Wallingford, to raise beautiful families, to live very productive lives, and to continue to serve in so many ways. So the other quality besides resilience that you've shown is this incredible commitment to service beyond military service. Because whenever I come into a room like this one filled with Vietnam veterans, I see people who have continued service beyond their military service. So people who serve in veterans organizations, helping other veterans, people who served at the town level as a volunteer on a board or commission, people who've been in elected office, people who are active in their communities, who uh, volunteer to make other people's lives better. You truly are the models for what good citizens should be. So today, we have the opportunity to say thank you for that continued service. And I think it's important that we do so now, sooner rather than later, uh, because sadly, um, our United States Department of Veterans Affairs uh, tells us that we are losing more than 600 Vietnam veterans every day in America. And so today, we have the opportunity uh, to say thank you. Um, and I wanted to uh, share with you a quote from President Obama's Memorial Day address in front of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, that memorial has the names of 58,000 people who were lost in our Vietnam War. And the President said this, when you returned home, you looked out for one another, you cared for one another. People weren't just talking about PTSD at the time. You understood it, and you were there for each other. Just as importantly, you didn't just take care of your own. You cared for those who followed. You made it your mission to make sure that today's troops get the respect and support that all too often you did not receive. So today we say thank you for that advocacy. We also remember and honor the 58,000 people who gave their lives in the war. And we remember the 612 people from Connecticut who were killed in Vietnam. There were nine Wallingford residents who lost their lives in Vietnam. Please join me in honoring Martin Wagner Anderson, Richard Nickel DeAngelis, Edward Robert Dorsey, Jean Edward Fecto, William Charles Fenton Jr., Renald Ludger Gagney, Richard Arno Johnson Jr., Timothy Wayne Keller, and Robert Leo Miglarina. We remember and honor those lost from Wallingford. So today, we have the opportunity 
to say welcome home, to say we appreciate your service. We are grateful for what you have done for this beautiful community, for our state, and for our country. God bless you, your families, and the United States of America. Thank you so much. So today I have the opportunity to introduce the person that Governor Lamont and I have charged with uh, caring for and serving more than uh, several hundred thousand United States military veterans who live in Connecticut, and that is our Department of Veterans Affairs Commissioner, Ron Welsh. Good afternoon, and thank you, Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz, for your kind words and always being out here in support of our veteran community and families. You heard the number of towns that she's visited around the state. I can't keep up with her. I think I've done about 45 so far, and I know I've got a lot more to do. <clears throat> and to your mayor for being here, and the other elected officials, thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to be with everybody to honor their service. To those of you that have served in Vietnam, or supported those that were serving Vietnam, welcome home, remember you're not alone. And you really should have heard that as soon as you step back on uh, American soil or you finish your time of service, whether you're overseas or not. And we know that didn't happen. Let me share with you that my oldest son, Steve, and I are combat vets of Afghanistan, not quite old enough to go to Vietnam. I was 15 in 1975 when our POWs were being released and our last our U.S. service members were coming back home. But the reason I joined was because of every one of you that have served. You are our heroes, our mentors, and our friends. As young kids, my friends and I ran around the woods in southeastern Connecticut, around Mysticrat and Ledger area. We climbed the trees, we built foxholes, we got up on the hills, we crossed the streams, we got down in the swamps, and we pretended to be you, soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen, depending on what day it was. Our uniform and equipment many times included, some of you might remember this, Sears and Roebuck, double knee, tough skin jeans. Uh, slingshots that we made, Red Rider BB guns, and I think one of us had a Mattel M16 with a grenade launcher. <laughs> I watched the evening news every night to try to figure out what was going on in that foreign land called Vietnam. I enlisted right out of high school on a challenging path to become an Army Ranger. I didn't really know what that was, but I found out pretty quickly. Um, I would be trained by drill sergeants, your peers, airborne Ranger instructors, and serving one of the two Ranger battalions at the time with mostly combat veterans as our leadership. We were never pampered by your peers, maybe even one or two in this room. We were trained hard in the most extreme environments we could find. The mountains, the Cascade Mountains out west, going up to 14,410 feet on one of our journeys. The jungles down in Panama, the Arctic in Minnesota and Alaska, and the Mojave Desert out in California. We did our missions by land, sea, or air, and we were held accountable for getting the mission done, though we'd be a lone survivor, just like the Ranger Creed says. This upbringing, many years later, enabled uh, our team of joint military service members to survive out in the highly contested portion out by the Pakistan border uh, of Afghanistan from 2005 to 6. And throughout many significant challenges, over nearly 40 years in the military, from private, being blessed to serve with a lot of really good people, pushing and pulling, and being able to retire as a general officer. And I owe all that to you, all of you. Thank you to you and your peers. Last September, a very difficult time for our country. As you remember 9-11, I was down to Sherwood Island with the Lieutenant Governor, and you know, it was the 22nd anniversary of the longest war in our history, and 
most of us will say it didn't end the way we thought it was going to end. And some things right now might be really triggering. I know every time I flip on the news, uh, some things come back. Uh, Ukraine, Russia, Israel, Hamas, and now all the antagonistic activity from Iran. So, you know, those of you that, that have served, you know that re-entry back into what many consider normal life has a lot of challenges. It has challenges to you and a lot of challenges for your family. Isolation and suffering and silence isn't the answer. It's never too late to ask for help. And when you close that door with a therapist, it's 100% confidential. And I know I don't have any kind of psych background, but when I look around, having been in the trenches, I know many of you have suffered in silence out of pride, and you just never want for help. I encourage you, please consider that if you think you need it, if you're depressed, or you're anxious, or PTSD, whatever the case might be. You'll feel better, and your family will feel a lot better. Please take advantage of what we have to offer at our Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs. We have a highly um, rated, actually a five-star rated skill care facility. They stood in a nursing home for 125 veterans. We have a residential facility for 150. We can expand to 170 if we need to. Really important for you that are in the room, whether you're a family member or you're a ser prior service member, is our Office of Advocacy and Assistance. There's offices down in Waterbury, Fairfield, Milford, Newington, and Norwich. Last Friday, we trained um, almost 100 municipal vet representatives, and we were telling them, your mayor prior at the last ceremony that it, it, I'm so glad to hear that you have a municipal vet rep in town. I believe his name is George. That's the first person you want to make sure you connect with because he will be able to help you with things like tax benefits and local services. It might be a, access to a food pantry for you or maybe a friend, some kind of stable housing, employment opportunities, and a health, a variety of things. But please go to that, go to that municipal vet rep. And after you talk to him, he'll connect you with one of our, our five district offices where that certified veteran service officer will help you file a claim. I know a lot of you heard that uh, something called a PAC Act and the expansion of the PAC Act about a year and a half ago. Well, the thing is, it's blown up. And the federal VA is many years ahead of where they were thought they were going to be providing health and providing expanded benefits. To the, to the tune of over a million people have been added to get those kind of benefits. So billions of dollars have been paid out to those that either got injured or sustained an illness while you served. Connecticut, we've been working with about 9,000 clients, our small team of veteran service officers, and that resulted in $125 million federal dollars back to those families and those veterans. Uh, and then lastly, we have our memorial services across the street in Rocky Hill. We have about 1,600 uh, buried there. And down in, in Middletown at our state veterans cemetery, about 16,000. We're working very hard with the governor, lieutenant governor's office to expand that. We have to expand that cemetery. We're in the final stretches of doing that now. So once again, we'll never be able to thank you enough. Tonight's all about you for your service and sacrifice. Welcome home, remember that alone. Bless you all. Thank you so much, Commissioner. It's my pleasure to introduce our host, Mayor Cervoni. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, good afternoon, evening, wherever we are. Um, I want to thank the Lieutenant Governor in our office for presenting us with the roadmap uh, that got us here. And then I want to thank George Messier, uh, who uh, I'm sure many of you know, he served with you, uh, for overseeing the work in Town Hall, and the work with the tax assessor, and the work with my office uh, to get the word out to you so that you could be here today. Um, when the Lieutenant Governor called my office and offered us this opportunity to honor it and acknowledge you without hesitation. I thought we should do so. 
So, as I look around the room, I see friends and familiar faces. I've met you at various places. Uh, as the governor, Lieutenant Governor said, um, you are the volunteers. I run into you uh, where you are doing volunteer work. And while some of you I've never met before, you look familiar to me because you are my parents' generation, more so than Korea. Um, my mother's squarely in your age, my father is a little older. And um, so I was born at the end of the 60s, and I went to primary school from 1973 to 1986. And the war that you experienced was merely a legend. Uh, I didn't really learn much about it until the 80s when it made the movies. And, uh, and saw some, some interesting portrayals of the after, aftermath and the like. Um, and I hope that our education system is fixed and addressed that because you are certainly more worthy uh, to be part of our education than you were when I was growing up. You know, I, the legends I heard, I, I have uh, friends whose parents uh, came back from the war and um, heard some of their experiences. And it was not something to encourage service in my generation. And I hope since then, uh, your work and, and other work has encouraged us to get back there. So, on the back of your uh, program today, there's a quote from Calvin Coolidge. No person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he gave. And, and that's an important statement, and, and it's a great statement in theory, and maybe you were honored for your service. Maybe it was just enough that you did what you did, um, but I don't think so. I think we are here to finally, formally acknowledge you in, in a positive experience for the work you did. You, you left the United States, or supported those who left the United States to go to a foreign land with which I'm sure most of you had no personal connection before you got there, and you did it to stand up for the freedoms that this country fights to preserve. And you did it with honor and valor, and I'm so grateful because you represented this nation in a terrific and important way at a time where it was not necessarily common to do so. And for those reasons, I think your service is distinguishable. So I'm very grateful. I'm glad we could do this today. Thank you, thank you for your service. Thank you, Mayor. It's my pleasure to bring up a fierce fighter for Wallingford in the state legislature. Um, she's so fierce she's got an injury, uh, but that is Rep State Representative Mary Mashinsky. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Weisswitz, for hosting this wonderful ceremony to honor these veterans who uh, are, are long overdue for this honor. There are um, some 57,500 uh, Vietnam vets in Connecticut now, and uh, 676 were from Wallingford, and I have a different number for how many died. I'm not sure why the discrepancy. Someone here may be able to inform me, but I, I had it as 12 died, and you have it as 9. It's 12? That's what I thought. Uh, serving between 1959 and, and 1975, where we lost more than 58,000 military personnel. Some in country who went through the jungle and, and uh, lived looking for the enemy and some Vietnam era, but all are Vietnam era uh, in the end as far as uh, being recognized as Vietnam vets. 
I know that many of <coughs> most of the bets less uh, were in there for a year and then uh, counted down the last few days when they could get the hell out of there and they were so anxious for those last few days. It must have been very stressful, I can imagine, being in that situation where you're marking down the calendar until you can finally leave. The people who supported the war here resented some of you, which wasn't fair, it wasn't right, um, because the war was lost. And so Vietnam vets didn't even have the camaraderie of other vets initially. I know it's changed now, but initially there were two categories of vets, and uh, one did not accept the other. So that was hard to adjust to. I can just imagine the stress and the pain that would have cost. And then uh, <clears throat> when vets came back from Vietnam, they had the lack of mental health care, they had addiction treatment and job training uh, that they didn't have. They did not get the hero's welcome, and uh, basically they were shunned by the mainstream due to the conflict being unpopular. It wasn't the soldiers that were unpopular, it was the conflict. But one bled onto the other. So if people were upset about the conflict, they took it out on the soldiers. Um, this was when we first started categorizing mental disorders that came from combat and uh, as, a, as an actual anxiety disorder beginning in 1980, and now it's a, a trauma and stress-related disorder, and is now recognized as something that needs to be treated. And the commissioner said, you know, if you're still feeling it, please take advantage of the services that the state and federal governments offer for people with mental health issues. One, one thing I did not know, not being a soldier myself, is that many Vietnam vets, or when they were in country, they were given amphetamines and other drugs to make their job of combat easier, and that would get them through the combat for the day. But then when they came back to the U.S. of A., all of a sudden they didn't have the combat drugs that, were, that they were issued. So that, that, was a big, that was a big influence on mental health. If you're being medicated while you're in, in country and then you come back and you're suddenly not medicated, I can imagine how that would impact your body. It just was a very tough transition and uh, alleviated pain at the time, but then you were kind of dropped at the end when you were not on the uh, antipsychotics to offer relief in combat. So as, as the other speakers have said, this is a welcome home day. And uh, this is how we thank and recognize the sacrifices that you made for our country. We uh, recognize it in Connecticut and federally as uh, March 29th, 1973 was the, was the, when the units finally withdrew. And so March 29th in our state is a day of uh, recognition in the Capitol. And the veterans come from all over Connecticut and they are honored in the Capitol. And in the, if you've been up there and you go between the legislative office building and the, and the uh, legislative chambers in the Capitol itself, you go by the Three Soldiers Monument. This is a little miniature version. It's about a foot high. It's a miniature version of the one in Washington, D.C., and it has three Vietnam soldiers interrupted. They have just heard something, and they are on high alert mentally. You can see it on their face. One of them was shaving, and one of them was half-dressed. And you could see that they were at camp and they were, they were uh, doing their usual routine and then suddenly they heard something. And it's expressed in that sculpture, Three Soldiers. So the big one is located in Washington, D.C. Has anyone seen the big one in Washington, D.C., Three Soldiers? No? Well, hopefully you'll get there someday. And it's, it's, near, the mon it's, near, the, uh, it's near the monument where all the names are inscribed. But there's a little one in, in Hartford, and we go by it every day when we go to work. Also in Wallingford, we are honored today that uh, one of the founders of the monument is here, over by the blue table there. Um, the veterans of Wallingford gathered together and wanted to create a monument to Vietnam War, war vets of Wallingford. It's at the end of North Main Street, 
right where Cedar and North Main is. It kind of leans over like a darkness. And, um, and the founders did not want any government money for this project. So they got 20,000 people to donate the money to build this monument. It's all private money, all small donations, which is really remarkable. So along with everybody else, I'm saying welcome home. You should have gotten this welcome sooner. But you're here. You're here to give out the uh, citations. And we honor you today. Thank you for coming. All right, so good news, the boring political speeches are done. And now is the best part, which is to hear from our veterans. I know, and everybody looks at me when I say that, and they're thinking, yes, but we learned in the military never to volunteer, but we hope that you might be willing to share a little bit about uh, where you were, what you did um, to talk a little bit about your service. And so I can start with the front row because this goes right to you. Or if you like, you could, you could come up and have your moment at the lectern. Who would like to volunteer me first? And, and yes, yeah, so, and I'm looking at women or veterans and omelets, so we'd be honored to have you say a couple of words. My name is Mary DeAngelis. I served stateside during Vietnam. Um, uh, I was an Air Force nurse serving stateside. I went in because of a statement that President Kennedy made and said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I thought, I'm sitting here in Wallingford, Connecticut. I need to be doing something for my country. So I joined and served two years active duty at a pilot training base in Texas, Lubbock, Texas. And uh, I stayed there for two years, came home, joined the Air National Guard for nine years, and then switched to the Army Reserve for 12 years. So I was lucky enough to do that and retired, started as a second lieutenant, retired as a lieutenant colonel. So, and I have to say, my brother. Richard's name is in golden grave in, on the stones. We lost him in Vietnam in 1968 as a combat medic. So I serve for him too. Oh, come on, be brave, guys. <laughs> there you go, see? The gauntlet has been thrown down. <laughs> I can't tell you what I did. I was there for a security service. Make sure they can see you because you don't have to look at you. I served in the Air Force Security Service. Uh, we were up on the Black Sea in Turkey, and we are up in the mountains, and we were intercepting everything that the Soviets put up in the air, you know, on, on telephone lines, you name it, we intercepted it. Two-thirds of the, uh, the site were uh, Russian linguists, and we're up there for a 15-month isolated tour, which means we didn't have anything around us. We were just up there by ourselves. And uh, some some of the things I can talk about now, which I signed away my life to say, I wouldn't say anything about them 50 years ago. Uh, we intercepted one uh, one uh, cosmonaut that went up in 1967, and. Uh, he went around the earth a few times, and then on his way back in, we were monitoring it, and he started screaming at the top of his lungs that, you've killed me, you've killed me, screaming in Russian, that they sent him up in a piece of crap <coughs> Soviet uh, spaceship. <laughs> and we listened to this poor guy coming down, all the way down, screaming at the top of his lungs, and, until we didn't hear anything. And in those days, well, still now, the Soviet Union landed, well, Russians now, landed on uh, hot ground in Siberia, where we landed in the ocean. His parachutes didn't open on his entry coming back. 
So he hit the ground at uh, considerable force. And that's one of the things that's still in my mind, listening to that poor guy screaming on his way down. So there's a gentleman who, oh yes, come right up here. Don't mean to interrupt. No. Thank you very much. Yeah, my name's Jim O'Brien. I was a Navy reservist from 70 to uh, 76. And I just want to say that this is very nice because I always felt the stigmatism of being stateside. I served active duty for two years in the Navy on the USS Shenandoah, keeping the destroyers in the fight. But I always really um, felt that the guys and gals that were in country, the ones that deserved the, uh, the honors. And although there was a lot of our generation that were conscientious objectors and they all went to Canada, and we all each did what we did, in my small way, I just felt insignificant until today you know, uh, this Vietnam era uh, veteran. I still take my hat off to everybody that was in country that carry shrapnel and it's no longer with us. I've got friends that came home and committed suicide. I've got friends that uh, got purple hearts and uh, you know, live with disabilities. And I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones. I did my duty and I would have done anything I had to do. I was just fortunate enough to be stateside and I just wanna thank everybody here that was in country and uh, Thank you for honoring us all. Thank you so much. So, wherever you were, you were helping the effort. So, sir, you are wearing the most beautiful uniform, and it still looks like it fits. Perhaps you could come up and let everybody see it, and maybe you could say a couple words about what, yes, yes? Let's give him a little encouragement. Look how good he is. Hello everybody, my name is Paul Donahue. I'm so impressed. I came home to Cambridge, Massachusetts. If you can imagine your stories. And my neighbor there now, he, he's trying to be a good neighbor to me. Um, I feel blessed. I never saw anything in your life that uh, changed your life so much. I was an infantry school leader. I graduated from college two weeks later, I was in the army. And uh, I wanted to just come in and get out and they wanted to go to OCS. I said no. So they sent me to Special Forces School down in Benin for a year, trained as an infantry squad leader. Walked into Vietnam, coming out of Cambodia. Everyone in the country had 10 months of war. So who's going to walk point today? I can't say what they called me, but it was a new guy. And I walked point my first two months in country. So I, I feel very blessed because I learned so many things there. I have to say that uh, trying, when I look out at everybody, I, I'm amazed because you, you walk down the street, you walk around, once in a while you see a cap. My reason I wore my uniform is I says I can tell a big story without saying a word because most people, I see what they have and what they did and everything else. I'm always, always curious as to what you did and where you were and how you did it. Because I know my one year over there cost me about 10 years coming home. I moved to Connecticut three years after I got home because I couldn't live in Cambridge anymore. And I didn't know a soul here. That's how much I had to get out of Cambridge. And I met my wife here, I got married, and I got two beautiful grandchildren, and I'm living to a right full of age, which I can't believe. <laughs> but um, I love the state, and I love what everybody's done for everybody else here. All I can say is God bless all of you. That's the best thing. My mother went through three tours. I had an older brother who did two, and myself. And we all came home in one piece, at least physically. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Come up, sir, and you'll be next. Representing the Air Force. 
thanks for the opportunity to, to speak. This is very nice. Didn't expect it. Am I going through? Yeah, you're just say, but tell people who you are. That's I'm Rick Marcosani, Richard Marcosani. Served in the, uh, the Air Force 66 to 70. And I uh, just wanted to tell two quick stories that stayed with me. We all have them. And uh, I'd love to hear more from others. But uh, these, these are mine. Uh, my first assignment in the Air Force was up in Maine. I did. Uh, basic training in San Antonio, Texas. They sent us up to Maine and uh, I was assigned to weapons. So we did uh, nuclear and conventional weapons, uh, missiles and uh, bombs mostly, a lot of rockets. And I was working on the F-101s, which was part of the Air Defense Command. We were watching the entire East Coast. We went from Florida to, is, did I say something wrong? Florida. I'm sorry? I Florida. Oh, is that right? It was a, it was a remarkable plane, the F-101. Uh, we learned a lot working on it. But what I wanted to tell you, and you'll appreciate this story, sir. There was a, a pilot that called in. He was having trouble with his landing gear. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm not practiced at this. So. I hope you heard the rest of it. So the pilot called in, and the, the, he was having trouble with his landing gear. And so we're all starting to sweat bullets. And, they did what they normally do. Uh, any Air Force people here? So they did what they were supposed to do. They foamed the runway right away. They, they knew it was going to be a mess. And I couldn't believe it. And this story is about what goes wrong. There's so much that goes wrong. And that was the first lesson I learned in the Air Force. Was, uh, be careful. You can't exercise enough care or safety. So he's coming in, his landing gear will not go down, and they know that he's going to have to land it on his nose and just make a god-awful mess out of it. And what do you think he did? He missed the phone. <laughs> of course he did. He, he missed the phone. And uh, we were expecting the explosion. Because you've got sparks flying. You've got, uh, what was it, J-9? Do you remember the fuel? JP-4. Thank you. JP-4. Yeah. memory is shot. JP-4. And that's highly explosive fuel. And uh, somehow it, that, it, did, it didn't blow. It was amazing. And the pilot walked away from it. And uh, that, that was my first story. And I saw that thing later in the hangar. You should have seen that nose. It, it was. Pretty sad. It looked, looked like the front of a shark's mouth. <laughs> and then that was stateside, and then they uh, eventually sent me over to uh, the Vietnam area. And I was assigned to B-52s, and I was to load with a loading team, uh, three-man teams that put the 500-pound bombs into a rack, and then another team took the racks and threw them up into the B-52s. And uh, they did this with a grid with stones, and uh, if, a t if a team blew up, it wouldn't set off the whole field. It was really quite a piece of engineering. And uh, it worked, it worked, because we were replacing the team that had just blown up. And uh, when a bunch of 500-pound bombs go off in this tight area, uh, we basically vaporize everything. And when we got there, and the reason I'm telling this story, when I got there, um, they told us that you're replacing a team that just, uh, just had an accident. So, so how careful do you think we were after that? Yeah. 
right. after we heard that. Unbelievable. Um, we, I'm standing here because we, we were very careful for that, <coughs> the time that we could live. Uh, incredible amount of, of uh, weaponry that was dropped. And I can say this because enough time has gone by. Um, we didn't fly around the, the uh, Laos at the bottom of Cambodia. We went right over to Cambodia. We went from Thailand straight to Granada. We went straight to uh, North Vietnam. And uh, I think that was the right thing to do. But that, that's my second story, and I'm sorry if I'm being too verbose. <laughs> Great. It's a little bit different from what people have been saying here. It was, uh, when I was in the military, we were get on the, uh, we were on a ship. Hold the you have to hold it. Higher. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, that's good. Hold it closer to your mom. The USS Bonhomme <coughs> Richard. Has anybody ever seen or heard that? Oh, you got we got You are the first person I have ever saw in Connecticut knew something about that. It's called cool. the Bonnie Dick. Our, our son was Bonnie Dick. Who said that? The Bonnie Dick. You're, you're right. The Bonnie Dick. Our son served on the Bonnie Dick. You've been my day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was a long time ago, of course. And uh, we, we, had the prob we had problems. What I did, and, I, and we, there's two people that, are, that take care of the flight deck. And the flight deck is, what you do is stand there and flag up and down. When the planes are coming in, they have to land in a certain way, in a certain place, because everything's moving, the, the boat and everything. So it's, it's a very dangerous type thing. And uh, one day, well, we, we took, there was two of us in charge of that. And this was for a long time, too many years, uh, three years uh, of this. And um, what happened is you, you have one guy stays in for an hour, uh, four hours, and you come back and then he does it for four hours, vice versa. And that's, that's how it works. Well, at one, this one point, we were making our change. I was going in and he was going in, you know, doing his thing. I no sooner walked away down the steps, and I heard this big crash on the, on the, on the deck. And uh, I was down about three steps. And when I went back in, ran back up there to see what happened, and my buddy that was doing the other half of the, the thing there, the plane came in, he hit the round down, on the back, the airplane came in, and the uh, this is hard to say. And and, uh, and he had so anyway, it, it broke off the the, 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 rock, the whole thing that walked the you know the. Take your time. You're good. You're doing great. <laughs> and the uh, the thing broke off and uh, and back and hit the, the, uh, the guy, my other partner, uh, at the back of the head, drove his head into the, into the, uh, the, the whole thing and, uh, and killed him instantly. And, uh, and it, was, it was a terrible thing. It, 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 was, it 
There was no way around it in Randy. Then we had, I ended up having, to, because he and I were friends and buddies and stuff like that, I had him be the guy that goes out there and, you know, with the stuff, because we had, they put him off the ship because it was, you know, was dead. Anyway. And so I, I was the one that had to go and tell his, his wife and his four kids that I knew of already. And uh, so this was near the end of our, our tour. So I had, to, I had to go drop off all the stuff. And the, the military wanted me to go to the wife and take care of it on my way home. So this I did was one of the hardest things that anybody could do. And uh, it, it almost killed me to do it. And this and the only time I have ever told this story to anybody at any time. And it just, it just bothered me that I had to do it <laughs> at this point uh, because uh, it was, it just was terrible. And uh, for all the, all the years, all I thought about is that you can never, you can never get rid of that. What, what's happened? And uh, uh, I don't know. I, it, it's, it's a terrible thing to have to tell everybody, but uh, it just bothered me so much that I thought I, it's time. Thank you. So. Good job. Yeah. Tough act to follow. Um, let this gentleman go, and then we'll be up. Thank you. Here you go. You know, you hear a lot of stories about somebody says, well, gee, I know somebody went to the VA, but I don't know anybody that ever came out. And I have to take exception to that because in the past year, I've been in and out of the hospital in West Haven. I've had a heart attack, a leg amputated, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I have to say that in the many years that I've gone either Newington or West Haven, I have never had a problem. I get my appointments on time and I got a ton of them. And you know, the, the care that I have received from all levels, whether it be staff, nurses, doctors, has been first class. Now, I know Connecticut has probably one of the best VA systems in the country. So my hat is off to anyone who is involved, and I would encourage anyone who needs help, don't hesitate to go there, because they'll take great good care of you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jim Beers, and I'm just going to uh, add a little different uh, twist to this. I, you can do all the laughing in a second. I was assigned at the age of 17 to military intelligence. <laughs> kind of like doesn't go together at times. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard all those jokes, but uh, if you want to share a laugh, that's fine. Uh, what I wanted to mention is when I was one of the things when I was over in Vietnam. I was with the military advisory team, 21. Those initially the advisors went over, played a small part in the war. As the war continued, they still had advisory units that lived with the Vietnamese. We were in, uh, would also coach their military. We were in the Central Highlands in Pleiku near the Laotian border. And we were fortunate to get called back to the Central Base Camp, camp at Tukor headquarters to see a show. Uh, an old-time comic actress, which I'm sure many of you know, named Martha Ray, <laughs> was going to perform. So we were waiting for a show, it was around 7 or 8 o'clock at night. Uh, she doesn't show up at the field. They canceled the show. We didn't know why. The very next day, they had that show. And uh, prior to the show, she was standing in a little alley 
before she went onto the stage, and I happened to ask her what happened last night. She wound up being in, uh, I think it was near Plateful Air Base, 71st Evacuation Hospital. She was visiting the troops in the hospital, and there was some action up north, and they were flying in some injured. She was, which I didn't know, she was a nurse uh, by trade, that's before she became an actress or something. She uh, said to the commander, I'm not going to go put on the show tonight. I'm a nurse. I am going to take care of these casualties with you. And I'm also, I believe it was a colonel or a captain in the uh, Army Reserve. I have rank on you. I'm going to stay here and do this. And she wound up working on the, uh, the wounded, showed up that night at Play Coup, didn't blow her own horn. And uh, besides that little conversation I had with her, I completely forgot about it until through the internet, you can start reading things. And if you want to go home, when you go home, read about what she did. And she is a hero, one of those heroes that supported us to the highest degree in Vietnam. And as for being an 18 year old kid while I was in Vietnam, we were fortunate to be with the Vietnamese. There's a lot of good Vietnamese people there. And our efforts were not lost. You see how that country is today, how they're getting westernized, and their standard of living is going up. And a lot has to do with what we did and what followed us with investors and what have you. So thank you. I am so proud to be in the same category as you guys here. Thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Brenda O'Brien, and I served in the, in the Navy from early 70 until late 71. We, uh, I worked at the Bureau of Naval Personnel in Washington, D.C., and my job was inputting the orders for all you guys. <laughs> no names were ever mentioned at all. But every time I had to write, write it up and input it, I would have a small breakdown myself. And we would wind up, every once in a while, I had made up these cards to go into the computer that would shut the computer down. No orders went out at all that day. So it was just our way of, of trying to help you guys. And I'm always been proud that I was in the Navy. Thank you. Anybody in this area while I'm over here? Okay. All right. Anyone else? Here. Okay, sure. There you go. Right there. I don't have to stand up. You don't? But all I want to say is, I went in the service in January of 55, but I was one of the lucky ones that didn't have to fight. And I look around this room at these veterans that are here today, and I have to take my hat off to them because they did what I didn't do. But the thing about it was, I graduated in, from Hill House in New Haven. And I didn't want to work, I was drinking, I was doing this, and my father says, either you get a place to live, or get the hell out. <laughs> so the thing of it is, he walked me down to New Haven, and I went into service. I joined for three years. I went to Fort Bragg, Fort Bliss, Fort Leatherwood, and I volunteered to go overseas, and where the hell did I go? Greenland. <laughs> Anyways, I ended up in Newfoundland. That's where I was discharged when I came back. But uh, I just want to say that the service made a man out of me. 
and I have three wonderful daughters that I look up to, and there are two of them here today. But I want to thank the vets that did fight for me. God bless them. Hi, my name is Gene Pino. I haven't lived in Wallington for very long, only about five years, but I was born and bred in Mirton, so I'm in. Can you just put this a little closer because I can't see yep. you? There you go, perfect. Went to Wilcox, um, 66, went in the service, went in the Air Force, 69, 70, spent in Vietnam. People who stop me and say, What did you do in Vietnam? I tell them I was a pilot. I used to take the stuff from over there and pile it over there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> people kind of, you know, you get a kick out of that. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. I went over there as a marksmanship instructor for the Air Force. They didn't have a job for me. So they put me in MACV. I wound up training in Mountain Yards and Mount Central Islands. Little places. Uh, saw stuff that you couldn't believe that people could do that to another person. But I came back here while I was there. My dad did pass away, and I had a daughter born while I was there. First time I saw her was in April. She was born in September. Every April on uh, Earth Day, I call her because that's when I hit the States. It was Earth Day. I call her and tell her, happy birthday. And she goes, it's in September. I says, yeah, but to me it's in April. You know, and uh, the man had talked about the VA. There's two VAs. You got the health VA over here. You got the paperwork VA over there. This side, the health side, is phenomenal. Absolutely great. The people with the paperwork, they could use a little work, you know. I mean, but it's it's very. If you're not in the VA system, get yourself down there and get in. It's well worth it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. Come right up. Uh, good afternoon or evening. My name is Paul Miller. I do live here in Wallingford, but I was born in Indiana. Um, I joined the Air Force, and I didn't go to Vietnam. I did end up in Thailand for a while, which, as you all know, is a, a very lovely place to be from. Uh, all the talk about the VA, uh, that's basically what I wanted to say. Uh, I worked for the uh, VA Newington and West Haven for eh, a short period of time, 45 years. I've uh, seen all kinds of stuff coming through the VA, and I'm glad to hear someone say something nice about the VA. Uh, even though the guy had said something about the paperwork, I was administrative. <laughs> And sometimes it does get the best of you, but my job at the VA was registration and eligibility. I was the supervisor. And we saw a lot of people, and we saw helped a lot of people, and uh, anybody who has something that is wrong, they were in Vietnam, you're automatically, regardless of your income, eligible because, as you well know, exposure to Agent Orange gives you an automatic priority to come and seek help through the VA. And even if you don't, maybe you should go talk to somebody anyway, because they're always there to help. The, uh, and when you do a lot of stuff at the VA, uh, registration and all these things, I've got one funny story, there's plenty to tell you, but there's one little funny thing. I was registering, this gentleman, he came up, he was uh, Japanese, and he wanted to sign up for care at the VA. 
And I said, okay, do you have a discharge? He, he handed me a discharge that was written in Japanese. And I said, well, when were you in the military? He says, World War II. And I said, American? He says, no, Japanese. I said, well, I, no offense, sir, but I think you were kind of like the, like the enemy. Uh, and he says, well, I heard that the VA, or that the uh, United States helped the Allies. I, yes, sir, they do. Allies. <laughs> Not, I said, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of World War II veterans sitting over there that if I mentioned who you were, you may not be too happy with. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much for all this, and it's great to see all your smiling faces. And thank you to all right. Anyone else? Going once. <laughs> All right. All right. A round of applause for everybody who spoke. So here's what we're going to do. Now we're going to recognize all of our veterans. And if hopefully you checked in on the way in because um, if you didn't check in, we don't know you're here, but we are not leaving anyone on the battlefield. So um, if you do not hear your name, don't worry, we are not going to leave until we call, if we call everyone up and recognize everyone. So with that, uh, we are going to start um, inviting people up to uh, get their photos made. And um, I do want to say that Councilwoman Tata is here. She is the vice chair of the town council, and she is standing in for the mayor, who has been called away. And we also have Darian McLaren representing Congresswoman Deloro. And uh, we're going to invite our officials to join us over here. And. Also, if it's more comfortable for you to get your citation and your pin in your seat, when we call your name, just raise your hand and we will all go right to you, okay? So, uh, with that, here we go. Joseph Baracco. Joseph Baracco. Frank Barboza. Okay. 
James Beers. To be followed by Walter Burge. Robert Bianker. <laughs> Mr. Bianker, thank you so much for your service. To be followed by William Biro. Stanley Brunel. John Burns. To be followed by Richard Carr. Chapel. To be followed by Charles Chapokas. Pasquale Sonati. Gary Craig. Douglas Connolly Sr. Rosemary DeAngelis.
James D. Brigetta. Followed by Paul Donahue. John Elwood. Thomas Fisher. Leon Furtak.
Stanley Good. To be followed by Brian Gray. John Hackbarth. <laughs> to be followed by Paul Hanks. Followed by Thomas Hayden. Followed by Peter Homestead. Robert Jacks. Be followed by Antoine John Drew. Followed by Gerald Cavanaugh. Followed by Martin Kelly. To be followed by James Kelby.
followed by Richard Kozak. Mr. 
Mackenzie. We Thank you. So appreciate Thank your you service. Much. We're going to go like this. We're going to gather all these Very folks much. around Thank for you. the photo, Thank and then we're going to look right there. To be followed by Robert Nago. Vincent Masada. Stephen Miller. Be <laughs> followed by Bruce Morris. Be 
followed by Daniel Nicholson. Brenda O'Brien. And James O'Brien Sr. Followed by Mark Asapowitz. followed by Ruth Palmer. followed by William Palmer. Watch your back. <laughs> yeah, not, you're not too stable. <laughs> to be followed by Bruce Palumbo. followed by Richard Papalo. James Patlap. Be followed by Thomas Tykarski.
Could I say something? Sure. Everybody, if your name is on the Vietnam Memorial, I had the great honor of putting it there and carving it in. I want to thank you for putting a face to the names. For 40 years, I've remembered these names. Thank you very much. classmates that I know, like they're like Frankie Barbosa and stuff like that. You all look great. <laughs> Were you a stone carver? Uh, wow. <clears throat> My goodness. That's amazing. I see. I see. Yeah. To be followed by Tom Poland. Followed by Ed Priest. Richard Rappenile. James Savage, Jr. Jim Shea.
to be followed by Oli Siverson. Followed by Jim Sullivan. Yeah. 
Robert Welgosh. Any other Vietnam era veterans from Walker whose name we have not yet called? All right, I'm going to ask one more time is there anyone whose name we did not call? Because if you snuck in here and you didn't tell us you're here, we don't know you're here. We don't want to miss anyone. Going once, anybody who has served between 1959 and 1975? Okay? All right. All right, a round of applause for our nation.
have a um, couple of housekeeping items. First, um, we hope that we spelled your name right. If we did not, please come here, let us know. We will fix that for you. Also, if you did not RSVP, we didn't know you were coming, so we will mail um, your citation to you. And also, if you would like to see uh, the photographs that our office took, if you look on the back of your program, there's um, Lieutenant Governor's Flickr page. You can find them there. If you have trouble, ask your grandkids. They'll help you find them. <laughs> Um, and um, let me just say what a great honor it is for uh, us to meet you and your families. Thank you again for your service and sacrifice for our country.